where it really makes a difference and really makes an impact. We've got a new focus on, on, on new products, on really trying to take step changes and move ourselves forward. And these last two I'd like to just spend a moment on. Strengthening our activities in fast growing <coughs> regions. Tom's, Tom's indicated already this afternoon how, how important the Asian marketplace is coming for us. And so we're setting up more activities, more development activities in the Asian region. And finally, of course, why are we here today? Strengthening links with universities. Let me say a little bit more about those uh, links we have with universities and the activities we can carry out in terms of. We have engineering and product development activities all over the world, usually associated with our, with our major factories around the world. We have two principal research facilities, two central research facilities, if you like. Uh, our, our major technology centre, our engineering and research centre uh, in New Bekein in, in Holland, and our manufacturing development centre close to our head office uh, in, uh, uh, in Gothenburg in Sweden. And if any members of the press would like to know more about those two, the, uh, the heads of those activities are, are here uh, in the audience this morning. The pictures of our, of our uh, activity in Holland. Then moving further afield, in Asia, we have established technology centres in Bengaluru, in India. Sorry, Bengaluru used to be called Bangalore, but the Indians seem to be changing the names of all their big cities. Bang Bangalore is now Bengaluru. It hasn't, uh, it, it's the same place. It's, uh, it's just changed name. And, uh, and uh, close to Shanghai in China. We have right now a little over 40 people in Bengaluru, uh, a little over 20 people in Shanghai. Our vision is to have both of those tech centres at 400 by 2015. It's a challenge. Can we do it? I don't know. I promise Tom we will. We're going to, we're going to do all we can to get, uh, to get those activities populated. We see big opportunities for doing development work in Asia. And then our University Technology Centre programme. Uh, first and foremost here at Cambridge, uh, we also have activities uh, with Imperial College in London and we recently announced uh, a, a new University Technology Centre uh, in Charmans in, uh, in Gothenburg and we are just thinking, and I'll come back and talk more about these uh, when I talk about our University Technology Centre, we're just establishing a toehold in China. So, let me talk about our core technologies. We have seven with one underlying core technology, so eight core technologies that we think of at the moment. Number one, first and foremost, steel and heat treatment. Bearing stress steels in ways that nothing else does. When I was on that side of the lecture theatre listening to, uh, uh, to my august lecturers in metallurgy in this uh, department, I was told that the, that the theoretical strength of steel from absolute first ab initio principles was about 20 gigapascals and that the maximum strength you could make a room of steel to was 2 gigapascals. Do you know bearings sometimes will innovate? Um, some of the people in the audience, I'm sure 30 odd years ago, told me that 2 was the absolute maximum. We have bearings that will innovate. So, how to get that sort of performance out of steel is critical. And bearing steels are different from other steels. And uh, our, we have led the development of bearing steels since our inception. And through this University Technology Centre and the work that we do within STF, we would like to maintain that position. Steel is not the only material that's important to us. Uh, we, are, we have strong interest in other materials. Uh, this bearing shows a, a, a bearing with ceramic rolling elements, uh, silicon nitride rolling elements. These are our highest rated bearings at the moment. Uh, you can put more of them through silicon nitride than you can through steel at the moment. Uh, it, still uses, it still uses steel rings, you still run it against steel. Um, but but we, uh, we exploit the properties of silicon nitride uh, quite aggressively. Sensorization. Uh, the whole move of adding electronic functionality to our precision mechanical parts. As I've indicated, we, are, we have significant strengths in electronics within SPF and we're increasingly applying that to sensorising our bearings. Tribology. Uh, tribology, uh, study of friction wear and lubrication, study of surfaces really. Uh, I really should change this slide because every time I show this slide they say, what is this? this that, that looks a very rough surface. Uh, and, and for those non-engineers amongst you, can I just draw your attention to the, uh, to the magnification that from 
top to bottom, uh, it's, uh, it's 21.6 nanometers, or about 60 atoms. Uh, so the fact that it would drop is, is purely because it's a pretty high magnification. Modeling and simulation. Uh, we put very strong emphasis and have done for a very long time on computational analysis of our products, of really understanding the details of what's going on within a bearing and indeed understanding the whole environment around our bearing. Uh, we need to use the bearing industry in our knowledge of, of modeling and simulation. And it's an area that we will continue to invest in very strongly uh, to build and develop our lead in that area. Lubrication, we've talked a little bit about that already. Uh, maintaining a stable oil film uh, between the rolling element and the ring. If you can, if you can stop the two touching, if you can get a thin, stable layer between the two, you can get uh, maximum performance from the bearing. Sealing, one of our platforms, clearly very important. And again, the materials, elements, and sealing, very much in terms of the the, the, the knowledge of the elastomeric materials and the performance of those elastomeric materials within the seal. And then underpinning everything, this focus on sustainability in the environment. So these are the are the sort of eight core principles, core technology that SKF is focused on. Why are we focused on core technologies? Well, Tom said earlier that uh, for our, for our, I think when we were talking over lunch, so perhaps not only here, but when we were talking earlier, he said uh, he went to our chief scientist, Stathis, who was in the audience somewhere, recently retired, uh, about 18 months before our 100th birthday, he said, I want to announce a major breakthrough in bearing technology for our 100th anniversary. And Stathis and the team pulled together a very small, very tight-knit team to say, who could we do this? And as a result of being expert in those core knowledge areas, being the knowledge engineering company in the space of 18 months, we took more than 30% out of the friction of the bearing without affecting its load carrying capability. How do we do that? Well, we didn't do it by cheating. We kept the dimensions of the outside the same. So to the outside world, this bearing looks like every other bearing that we make. But we optimized the internal geometry. Through our knowledge of modeling and simulation, <coughs> we were able to change the internal geometry subtly to take friction out. We changed the steel cage for a low friction polymer cage. The cage is the thing that holds the rolling elements in the right place, holds them apart. And through the knowledge of lubrication, we were able to put in a low friction, high stability grease that in total took 30% out of the friction. I say 30%, in many cases it's, it's significantly more than 30%. Then we go on and talk about our changing way of thinking about our MD. We, if you think about a, a, a product life cycle of, of, of starting with conception, moving through a growth phase into a volume manufacturing production phase, we now do quite consciously different types of research and targeting different types of people at these different types of areas. In the volume area, really what you need to do is to just keep freshening the product, just incrementally changing it to make it look ever new for the customer. Customer driven innovation, give the customer what the customer thinks the customer wants, but he really needs to make that bearing outperform our competitors. Critical part of our, of our development work. This is an area we've been strong in, technology driven invention, really looking to take those steps forward, and this is an area that we're going to strengthen more in the future. And then there's, then there's the area at the beginning, and this is where the University Technology Centre is really coming. This is an area where we've probably been weak on historically, if we're honest, of looking at those early stages, looking to, to, to get the intellectual property at these early stages. Strategy driven, we want it to be going in the direction of the future of the, our industry, the future customer requirements, and this I see is one of the major benefits in this partnership with the University that we're, we hope we're giving you the opportunity to invent things, but we're going to give you the direction that the world wants to move in, so that those inventions are successful, can be applied, and really make, uh, make major improvements 
for, for the world and for our customers. So let me talk a bit about our, our university technology program. The rationale is for us to set up strategic partnerships targeted on our key areas. To be honest, we're we'll uh, copying a model that Rolls-Royce started about 30 years ago. Uh, I'm sure you, many of you will have noticed as you, as you walked into the, to the lecture theatre this morning, you walked past one of the Rolls-Royce University Technology Centre. Uh, I have watched what Rolls-Royce have done for many years and have been extremely impressed at the way Rolls-Royce work with universities in a partnership where both get real benefits. And, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to try and do that first day. What we're really trying to do is create critical mass. SKF has a long history of working with universities, but we generally fund one PhD here, there, and everywhere. We believe that by focusing on our core areas and focusing attention within the university, sponsoring a good number of people, and then trying to build partnership around that, we can really create the best value both for the university and for SKF. We're funding uh, six people in the, in, in the University Technology Centre at SDS expense. Before the end of this year, there will be another four joining them, uh, funded by other people. Uh, and my vision, uh, if I could follow the Rolls-Royce model, we should be able to get to 20 people uh, in, this, in this type of program. Um, and I very much hope we can get there. We are very keen, obviously, to work with leading universities globally, and I don't think I need to say any more uh, about what are leading uh, player at Cambridge University is uh, in, the, in the global field of universities and, and they look for partnerships and, I, and I'm very pleased at the number of our partners and potential partners that have, that have joined us here today uh, and I'm very much looking forward to working with those people. Finally let me just return to those, to those eight areas and show you how they match up with, uh, with our programme of, of university technology centres. These are the eight titles that I had before, so steel and heat treatment, non-metallic materials, sensorization, topology, modeling simulation, lubrication, sealing, and sustainability. And, uh, and Cambridge here at the top, our very first university technology centre uh, on steel and heat treatment. Um, we are just beginning to talk to Tsinghua University in Beijing uh, about the university technology centre on elastomeric materials for sealing applications. We've started that work, but so far it, it's one PhD, but, uh, but so far we have established a really good working relationship. Tsinghua, I think, is one of the top two universities in, in China. Uh, it's, by all accounts, the top technical university in China, so it's the sort of, it's the sort of Cambridge, but Peking University is the sort of Oxford, I think, really, uh, if we can use that analogy uh, in China. Um, they don't work a lot with non-Chinese uh, companies. They don't actually even work all that much with Chinese companies. Um, many people say to me, am I worried about intellectual property working in China? And the answer is yes, I am. Uh, I think it's changing. I think when the Chinese have intellectual property of their own, they will realize the need to respect other people's intellectual property. Um, so far, as I say, our, our one PhD is on, is on looking at aging behavior of elastomeric materials. And to be honest, it's mainly looking at the aging behaviour of our competitors in last American materials. So I'm not worried about the intellectual property issues, no, not very much. Uh, Imperial College, uh, we have a programme of work in Cape Talk about a year behind Cambridge. Uh, but we have that uh, up and running, and there are people from our, our University Technology Centre here, Professor Ekin Spikes, uh, I'm here in Kanyevich. Uh, we have a, a strong team uh, from, from Imperial, I'm very pleased they've joined us. Uh, very interesting work on tribology and modelling and simulation uh, that, uh, that I would uh, advise you to talk to, to them about if you're interested. Um, and finally, sustainability in the environment. We announced uh, just at the end of April we were establishing a, a university technology centre close to, close to our, our head office, uh, close to where it's getting started in the Um uh, They are quite expert in fields of life cycle analysis, life cycle uh, management. Uh, and, uh, and that's a real strong area for SKF. So that I hope has given you some introduction to SKF's technology, some introduction to, to, to why we're doing uh, the work we're doing here in Cambridge and, uh, and the work particularly with our university technology centres. 
I think uh, we'd all be very happy, all the speakers would be happy now to take some questions at this stage, if, uh, if any of you have questions. Thank you very much. So thank you very much indeed, Alan, for that perspective, and thank you very much to Tom and Alan for, I think, opening a window for us on a wide SKF landscape, and we can see the levels of inspiration in the company and direction that can make us quite clear in our minds that SKF are a partner of choice. We now turn with our backs to that window and face into the university and decide, is the university a partner of choice? And it will be my aim to say yes, and yes because it has people like Harry. Of course, my job as head of department is very busy. Harry does all the work and I'm busy taking the credit. And I, by the time I've sort of filed away some bit of the credit and turned around to recover, Harry's done something else. A man always bringing along surprises. I didn't really expect that he would decide to cook steel at the temperature you cook pizza. I didn't really expect that that would have the most wonderful properties and exploitable nature. I didn't really expect that it would have a beautiful microstructure. And I didn't expect that that microstructure would appear on a set of ties being given out to this audience today. Um, so we hope you see you all changing into those ties later. Your pack also, I think, is a book by Harry. So this, as you will know, in Cambridge is our examination season. So our part two and part three examiners are very busy. They've already set a paper on Harry's book. And you can pick up the scripts on the way out and you'll be examined on it. Um, and Harry has the, uh, some inspiration to guide you through this book. Harry. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. Um, at the outset, I should say that you know, there's an awful lot of people involved in this research. And all my acknowledgments will come at the end. Um, I specifically chose this title because I was having lunch in my college, Darwin College, about 15 years ago. Of course, I had lunch today as well, but 15 years ago, <laughs> there was somebody sitting next to me, and I asked them what they do. It turned out to be the Royal Society Professor of Cosmology, Andy Fabian. And I asked him what he did, and he said he's looking at the gas between clusters of galaxies. And then he asked me, what do I do? And I said, I work on iron. And he went to quiet. <laughs> and then 30 seconds later, he said to me, hasn't time been around for a long time? I posed the question to him that hasn't the universe been around for a long time? <laughs> so, like SKF bearings, steel is a silent material because it works so well that you don't have to think about it like you have to think about, you know, Microsoft operating system and the crash. <laughs> now, we've already had a lot of numbers, you know. Um, Alan Bagg said, theoretical strength of steel is about 20 gigapascals. What does that actually mean? And then I will mention numbers which are even smaller. So I'm going to start by an explanation of numbers. This is one billion, and this is uh, sorry, that's moved up. This is, <laughs> this is one billion. Okay. So nano means a billion, and giga means a billion. But what then is a pascal? So you know that this is the University of Newton and Darwin and Erasmus. It turns out that the force, the weight of an apple is about one Newton. You put one apple on one square meter, and that's one pascal. So when we talk about one gigapascal, we're talking about a billion apples on one square meter. So these are incredibly large numbers, and I will also talk about incredibly small numbers. And when I first looked at bearings, and I did some very elementary calculations, I was astonished. I couldn't believe the numbers that I was getting, so I'll give you an example. So I've rounded off these numbers, and not all bearings work under these conditions, but there are certainly bearings that work in this way. So let's assume that we have a contact pressure of 2 gigapascals. We've got a ball on the surface, and under the surface we'll get a pressure of about 2 gigapascals. And it's going round at 25,000 RPM, revolutions per minute. And let's assume there are 20 balls in the ring. Then you experience a stress pulse 
at a point under the surface half a million times per minute. Okay, so two gigapascals is two billion apples over a square meter. You're getting that experience half a million times a minute. So the steel is being punched <laughs> half a million times per minute at a stretch which is two million apples per square meter. Now, is there any other material that can take this sort of punishment? And so to the credit of all those who have worked on bearings for you know, the last hundred years, that these are real numbers which serve in bearings which are in operation and they serve mostly reliably. Now, the one particular steel which really has functioned very well for decades and decades it has a very simple composition. Uh, it's one weight percent of carbon and about one and a half weight percent of uh, chromium. And it has a structure which is like this. There are these particles of cementite. Cementite is a hard phase. And this is lightly tempered martensite. The martensite is also a strong phase. And temper it just a little bit, then it retains its strength. It's a very strong material. And this is the sort of range of compositions that you can pick up from the literature. Uh, about one and a half chromium and one carbon. This steel has sold for more than 100 years. Okay, so very well for more than 100 years. And the improvements over the last uh, four decades or so have really been in this area. These are very, very small concentrations of elements that will exist in the steel, even if you don't put them in. So sulfur, for example, uh, is about between 3 and 0.003 uh, and 0 to 3%. Keep this number in your mind, about 0 0.015 of phosphorus, nasty element to have in the steel. Oxygen concentrations are 6 parts per million in modern bearing steel. Just six parts per million. So by cleaning the material up, the performance that we've had from this particular alloy system has improved systematically over the last four decades. Now, these are incredibly beautiful products to look at. Yeah? And we want them to go further than the performance that we've achieved over the last four years. Now, how do we do that, given that we're going to experience this stress pulse roughly half a million times per minute? There's no simple answer, because in order to design a new steel, you cannot simply look at one of these aspects. You've got to have a big picture in which you think about all the variables, and it's very complicated because you've got to be able to make the steel, you've got to be able to form it into a particular shape, You've got to subject it to so many tests <coughs> to prove that it's reliable because before you actually sell it to a customer. And of course, it's got to have a reasonable cost or a true life cost. Let's look at just one of these aspects to begin with. And that is that when you form these rings and so on, the material has to be soft, relatively soft. Okay? Uh, the structure, typically, of this uh, steel is perlite. Perlite is written in the textbooks as alternating layers of cementite and ferrite, and this makes the material too hard to form into shape uh, during the manufacture of bearing components. So one way is to heat treat it so that the amount of surface per unit volume between the cementite and ferrite is minimized, but that's a very expensive thing to do, just to hold it until everything is clarified. It's just that it's you know, basically the same principle that you take a soft cross and allow the bubbles to cross it. So, why is it so difficult? Well, the textbooks are wrong in saying that these are alternating layers of cementite and ferrite. The real structure, which Hillert in Sweden actually showed, I forget when, but many decades ago, is that each colony of perlite is actually a bicrystal of cementite and ferrite connected in all three dimensions. And there's a very simple way of illustrating this. Imagine that your cabbage is the cementite. Okay? All the leaves are connected in three dimensions. You put this cabbage in water, and the water is the ferrite, and the water is connected in three dimensions. If you slice it, you see apparently alternative layers of vegetable and water. 
this is a three-dimensional structure which is very difficult to change uh, by heat treatment, or at least not economical, simply to anneal it until it ferroidizes. So the Bering's people uh, discovered uh, another method of producing this structure here, where you have spherical particles in a ferrite matrix, and it's soft enough, something like 230 Richard hardness, to form into shapes. Now, whenever we design a new steel, we will have to have it in a softened condition at some stage. So this is an important heat treatment process. What we need to do is to speed up this process and to design steels which are capable of being softened. Okay, so if you cannot soften them, then you will have to develop another technology to make it into shapes. So what we need is for these alternating layers of cementite and ferrite to become divorced and form particles when the austenite actually transforms at the eutectoid temperature. So conventionally it transforms into this structure where we have these layers of ferrite and cementite. We want this to happen instead. So to start with some cementite particles in the austenite, it's possible for the transformation front to simply move and for those particles to grow without actually establishing a cooperative growth between ferrite and cement. Now you would have thought this is a simple problem because you just calculate the velocity of this transformation front and of the alternative, and whichever velocity is higher, that structure will evolve. <coughs> when we try to look at this, because we, you know, almost all the work on Perlite has been done at the university, the theory simply isn't sufficiently developed to apply to an industrial problem. So if you look at the very latest work on this process of divorcing the eutectoid, right? it simply isn't good enough. It doesn't take account, for example, of the diffusion of things like chromium, silicon, manganese during the pearlite transformation. If you don't take account of that, clearly you will predict the wrong velocity. So we've done work in the department which is the most rigorous theory for the perlite transformation. It doesn't assume that the perlite grows by <coughs> diffusion in the parent phase, or by diffusion in the boundary, or by diffusion in the parent. Any diffusion part is possible, and whatever the system chooses depends on the circumstances. So by doing that, we've got a rigorous theory for the perlite reaction, and the theory for this reaction has been available for some time. And if you look at the previous work, which, which wasn't published long ago, uh, that would predict the transition from the divorce to the lamella structure according to this line. And this is the new theory where we have a much bigger domain where we can produce this uh, divorce structure and indeed the experiments, critical experiments here, validate that neglecting the role of home distribution is not good enough that has a big impact on the dynamics of Perlite. Now, the reason why I put this story is this work was not sponsored by ASCAF. But what we are effectively doing is there is so much going on in the university that we can <coughs> pick up those ideas and become relevant <coughs> to varying steels. So any steel that we develop will have to develop a softening mechanism, and we can now use this theory to predict the circumstances in which we can divorce the eutectoid. <coughs> Hydrogen is a nasty atom as far as steels are concerned. And in a bearing, one part per million of hydrogen is sufficient to cause problems. Okay. Now, one part per million, you can manufacture bearings to that uh, concentration. But when you go into service, you might get further hydrogen being introduced into the steel to corrosion reaction contamination in the lubricant, etc., etc. And there are many, many theories for the way in which hydrogen embrittles the steel. And one which has gained popular uh, acceptance is that hydrogen actually enhances plasticity. And a lot of it comes from this experiment where pure iron was put into an electrolyte and when you switch on the current, when the hydrogen enters, the flow stress decreases. And when you 
take the current off the flow stress and increase it. But this is pure iron. The alternative theory is that hydrogen actually changes the cohesive strand and therefore can rip it from the field, uh, is, is being neglected, I think. And if you look at a stronger steel, this is nowhere near bearing properties, but it's still stronger than pure iron, you can see that effects like these are actually of minor importance, whereas the change in ductility because you promote the free weight pressure more is dramatic. So bearing steel will come higher up on that scale. So we are not clear on the mechanism by which hydrogen actually influences bearing steel. Okay. Not experiments on pure iron or soft materials or nickel, etc. Uh, we are not clear about how hydrogen works. <coughs> and just to show you, um, this on the original scale in which uh, the graph was plotted, for pure iron it looks like a dramatic effect. When we look at the strengths that we are interested in, I'm not clear that hydrogen has a big effect on plasticity. Now, what can we do about it? We don't know the consequences of hydrogen. We don't know whether hydrogen actually contributes to the initiation of cracks. Now, the initiation of cracks is very important because under a pulsating stress, the crack faces will rub against each other. And that will create something called white matter. So, a lot of the papers will assume that white matter is what causes damage. But we don't know that. Is it the actual initiation of the original defect which leads to white matter which then causes it? Okay, let's put all that aside and let's think about what we can do about the hydrogen problem. <coughs> hydrogen is going to get into the steel. Perhaps we can stop it from doing damage by trapping it at sites where it wants to be. And this is the normal response from a bearing steel, that you've got a lot of diffusible hydrogen. So this is basically a spectrum that you take a piece of steel charged with hydrogen and allow the hydrogen to evolve as a function of temperature. If your peak is at a low temperature, then it's diffusible hydrogen. If it is trapped at strong traps, then it evolves at a higher temperature. Now, how can we design a steel in which there will be traps for hydrogen? Well, you can put in particles which are coherent with the steel so that hydrogen is attracted to those regions and therefore they will be effectively trapped and rendered innocuous. And if you look at this graph, uh, this is also in part per million, by the way, there is an enormous trapping capacity here compared with the one part per million or two parts per million that you might expect inside uh, a steel that has been in service. So potentially, this is a good way of solving the problem without understanding necessarily the mechanism of hydrogen embrittlement. But the difficulty is that to produce these carbides, you have to temper the steel at 600 degrees centigrade. Now, if you temper the steel at 600 degrees centigrade, you're going to lose the strength. Okay? So we are working, since this is a blunt shots and Pedro Rivera, are working on a clever way of retaining the strength of a bearing steel. That means a very low temperature temper, something like 100 degrees. And yet, having these particles which will only precipitate at high temperatures because they contain substitution of solids. So, for bearing steels, this would be a really innovative idea. Now, let's assume that we've made steels sufficiently clean and we've solved the hydrogen problem. How can we improve that further? Because there's no possibility really of reducing contents to much less than what we have right now. Well, when you do that, other features of the structure, you know, it's like, uh, like having a heart attack. Yeah, you improve your fitness, etc. Eventually, you've got to die. Right? So some other mechanism comes into play. <laughs> and these are the semen-like particles that are present in the field. And they are there for a purpose, you know, they help in terms of wear resistance, they help in terms of uh, you know, hardness, etc., etc. But cementite is a brittle case. Yeah, it, it will crack given sufficient opportunity. 
So can we actually design a bearing steel with the right properties, extremely strong, without any seam entanglement? Yes. Now that we can make bearing steel, let's completely remove the seam entanglement. So here is a simple way. 